But anyway, um, I'm really glad to, to come back to North Carolina um, and talk about my work on looking at lead in water um, and how it affects children's blood lead levels. So uh, Stefan mentioned that you really don't want to have um, lead in your children's blood. This is lead is actually one of the oldest known toxins. And there's many, many, many studies showing that exposure to lead, especially in early childhood, leads to cognitive damage that's permanent. So this here on the, on the right here, this is just a chart from a, a gigantic pooled analysis of many, many studies done around the world. And this is the blood lead level me measured in children's blood. And then this is the effect on IQ. And what you can really see is that there's this fairly steep decline even at low exposure levels. Um, so in the US now, our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has established five micrograms per deciliter as a threshold that signals uh, elevated blood lead. But, but you can see that the damage really starts before then. So even though I'm going to be focusing on this five today, ideally, we just want to prevent this, this exposure from happening at all. Um, and so I mentioned there's, there's this effect on IQ, but then there's all sorts of long-term consequences of that. Kids who are exposed to lead and have elevated blood lead can have difficulty in school. There's even many studies showing increased risks of, of juvenile delinquency and all kinds of other undesirable outcomes. Um, so in the United States in the 1970s, there was actually a professor at uh, the University of Pittsburgh School of Public Health who really started documenting problems with lead in the United States in, and its effects on children. And that led to a whole series of regulations to really phase out the use of lead in many products, beginning with gasoline. So it used to be that lead was in gasoline as a, um, an anti-knock agent, I think. Those, Stefan, you would know if I'm <laughs> right, that that's what it was used for. But anyway, um, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency issued regulations to begin phasing it out because when lead was burned in gasoline, um, it was released into the atmosphere and then it would settle in, in dust and soil and things, and that was a major exposure route. Lead was also present in paint, in household paint, and children could become exposed if they would, you know, um, uh, well, they wouldn't have to necessarily eat paint but be exposed to dust from deteriorating paint. Um, it was banned in the 90s in, in canned goods. Uh, by 96, lead was completely banned in gasoline in the US. And then um, regulators started to realize that an, an, another important source that wasn't adequately controlled was drinking water. So beginning in the 90s, public water supplies in the United States had to start using corrosion inhibitors to prevent the release of lead from plumbing lines. Um, so this is actually efforts to control lead or one of the major public health success stories of the second half of the 20th century in the United States. Um, and this is, is showing from national data. These are age groups, so 1 to 5 years old, 6 to 19, 20 to 59, and over 60. And these are time periods. So you can see in 1999, this was the average blood lead level in children was well over 2. And you can see it declining over time to where it is now, um, well under one microgram per deciliter. And these declines have occurred across age groups thanks to these policies. But um, there's been a lot of attention recently to uh, lingering risks, risks of lead uh, from water. And who here has heard of the Flint water crisis that happened in 2015? It made international news. The city of Flint, Michigan, um, which is right near Detroit, uh, basically declared bankruptcy. It's one of these deindustrializing northeastern U.S. cities where the auto industry moved out and there was a lot of population flight out of the city and leaving the city without sufficient revenue to manage its infrastructure. So the city declared bankruptcy, and, and bankruptcy managers were brought in, and they said, well, we're spending an awful lot on the drinking water in this city, because we're buying our drinking water from the city of Detroit. So instead, why don't we start taking our water from the Flint River, a very dirty river, um, and, and we'll get the water at much lower cost that way. So the bankruptcy managers came in and switched the water source and failed to um, 
adequately control the corrosivity of this, this new water. So the Detroit water had corrosion inhibitors in it. And a lot of lead and other metals started dissolving in pipes in the water distribution systems and in people's homes. So there's just a picture. The orange is, is not from anything hazardous. That's iron, but it's just an indicator that something is going on. There's a change. So there's the Detroit water and the flint. Um, why, is, why did this happen? So um, it used to be that most water distribution lines were, were lead. They had lead in them. In fact, that's the origins of the term plumbing. I believe PB is the um, uh, shorthand version for, for lead, and plumbing is PB. Um, but when water utilities use corrosion inhibitors, like in this pipe here, you can see this scale building up. And that prevents the dissolution of metals from these pipes into the water. And you can see what happened. These are some pictures from pipes in Flint where without this adequate corrosion control, all this scale just um, dissolves. And then the metals start to dissolve. And so, so that's really the source of, of what happened in Flint. Um, but I will uh, add that, so th this brought a lot of attention to municipal water supplies. And there was a big uproar about it. And there's been a lot of discussion about municipal water supplies. But I will. Um, in the United States, about 13% of the population doesn't get their water from one of these central water systems. They get their water from private wells in their backyard. And this is just a map of the, the size of the population that gets their water from private wells. And why this is important is that people without a connection to a central water system don't have that required protection of the use of corrosion inhibitors. And their plumbing can still contain lead in it. The components of their wells can contain lead in it. And unless people know that they need to check the corrosivity of their water, and if it's a problem, use corrosion inhibitors, they're at risk of exposure to lead. And so that's what I've been working on um, for a few years now. And I've gone around with some of my students, and we've tested well water around North Carolina to see um, you know, is there really lead occurring in private well water? And this is just a histogram from some uh, samples that we collected in Wake County, which is the, the neighboring county to where we are right now. And 28% of the wells had more lead in them than would be allowed in public water systems. And during the Flint water crisis, this was about the same rate of occurrence of high lead. It was, it was present in up to about a third of the households. Um, not every household had high lead. So this is really a lot. Um, of lead exposure from private wells. And so that led me to the question of, well, are children then in homes with private wells at increased risk of having too much lead in their blood or having any lead in their blood? And if so, can we figure out which houses are most at risk? And why it's important to figure out which houses are at risk is that actually the public health department could use that information and try to uh, contact those houses and have outreach programs specifically targeting those houses where people get private well, rely on private well water where their kids may be at risk. And they can encourage people in those houses to get their water tested and install water filters or corrosion inhibitors if there's a problem. So, so that was my interest to see, you know, can we figure this out? We're seeing lead in the water. Is there a problem? Now in Flint, the rate of elevated blood lead in children doubled during the water crisis. In some parts of the city where the lead exposure was especially high, it quadrupled up to about, I think, uh, in some neighborhoods, about 17% of the kids had elevated blood lead, which is, again, above that 5 micrograms per deciliter. Um, and so to, to look at this question, um, I was able to get, uh, thanks to our, our North Carolina Childhood Blood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program, access to a, a data set of 20 years worth of a children's blood lead test results for Wake County. Again, that's the neighboring county to where we are. Um, it's the location of Raleigh, where you all arrived at the airport. And so there were altogether um, 226,000 records. So I got from them a big spreadsheet with the child's address, their age, their birth date, um, the date of their blood lead test, um, trying to think what else, so the, the result of the test, the type of blood lead test, uh, the gender. And from that, there were multiple tests for some children. So from that, we eliminated the duplicates. And we were just looking at, well, what was the maximum measured amount of lead for any child? What happens is if a child is found to have elevated blood lead, 
the state actually is required to go to the house and conduct an investigation and try to figure out where the lead is coming from and then go back and retest. So we wanted to see you know, what were the factors driving the maximum occurrence. And then what we did is we matched each child's address to tax records to get information that I will show you now. So, so we could determine what their water source was and get other information about their property that might be useful in making predictions. So um, it turns out in the United States these days, it's really hard to figure out where people's water comes from. We used to ask in our national census, where do you get your water? Do you have a piped connection to a city water supply or a private well, or do you get your water from a spring? But in 1990, the government stopped asking that question. So it's very rare, but in Wake County, the property tax department actually collects that information. That's one of few places where that's done. So we were able to get information about all of the residential properties in Wake County and what their water sources are. And then we ran a matching algorithm to match those to the children's blood lead data. So we know for each child's house, are they drinking their water from a private well? Or are they getting it from a water utility that's regulated and required to check for lead and use corrosion inhibitors? Um, so anyway, after this matching and some elimination of missing data, um, and, and missing dates and things like that, we ended up with almost 60,000 records. Um, and so then the goal is, again, to figure out, can we find out from information about the children's households, their water source, and the neighborhoods they live in, who's at risk? Um, this is just an example. Um, again, we had 20 years of data, but our water source data only go back to 2002, so that was 15 or 16 years of data, I guess. So this is for the year 2017. What you can see is the blue dots are addresses of where children live who had blood lead tests. The dark blue dots are the kids with private wells. You can see, of course, they tend to be concentrated in the periphery here. This is Wake County. Here's Durham County, where we are now. So anyway, so we have this data set, addresses matched with information about the children's blood lead test results, some information about the children, the characteristics of their house, their neighborhood, and so on. Um, Another thing I wanted to just point out, because um, I might mention it later, is that some of these houses are right at the fringe of cities. And these are some areas I've been working in lately where you could really easily run a water line to these houses. You can even see some of them here. They, they're even like donut holes in the city boundary, but they're not officially part of the city, so they don't get the city water. Um, so that was another variable we looked at. Are, are they within striking range of a city water system? Um, we began with just regression models. Um, and Steve talked about all the limitations of that, I guess. We began with this very traditional workflow, exactly what Steve described. Um, and our focus for now has been to predict what's the probability of a child having a blood lead concentration above this CD3, C threshold of five. And so our, our traditional approach was to just build a logistic regression model um, where w what we're predicting, for those who don't know what that is, is the odds ratio of a children having elevated blood lead if they're on a private well compared to the odds for a child who has regulated community water service. And uh, this logistic regression function, basically, you, you must make the assumption that the, the log, natural log of this odds ratio is a linear function of all these predictor variables. So that's really a very constraining assumption. Not too good at accounting for interactions either. Um, and then we thought, well, let's try a Bayesian network model. And here I'm going to issue a great apology because we've really just started this. And so I'm, I'm, the model I'm going to show is very primitive. Um, and I could use all kinds of feedback on how to develop a stronger model. So this is very preliminary modeling that I'm showing today. Um, but what I've done so far is just you know, the most basic um, supervised learning technique of, of an augmented naive Bayes network basically using the same variables that were in the logistic model, except that eliminating things if their mutual information with the risk of elevated blood lead is not significant at, at a p-value of 5%. And then to compare these things, um, I've been using a metric of area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, which many of you know, but for those who aren't familiar with it, when we have a binary outcome, in this case binary is the child above or below 5, um, and you're trying to build a model to classify 
your children or whatever you're trying to predict into one of those two categories? Are they a, a zero or one, a, a, an above or below? You always have to trade off, make a trade off between false positives. Um, or basically the specificity of your model and the sensitivity, so your ability to correctly find the kids who are at risk without having flagging too many kids who are not at risk. And so the way that usually this met trade-off is measured is with an area under you, you plot these for different thresholds. You say you could say, well, if if the child's probability of, of elevated blood lead is above 50 percent, I am going to um, classify them as a one. But that might not that might give you you know, not enough sensitivity here. So you can, you can try various thresholds, and that's where this curve comes from. If you just have a model that's completely random, this is what your curve looks like, and you end up this area is 0 0.5. Your ideal pr classifier would, would have a curve that went straight up here and then straight over here, and that just never happens um, in my field. So what we're trying to do is shift this curve as far this way as we can get it. So that's my, my metric that I use to see is this classifier working. I want to plot this curve, and I want to move it that way as much as I can. Um, all right. So what are we finding so far? So just I'll give you a little bit of summary data about this large data set. Well, luckily, because of all of the controls that have already been put in place, not too many kids have lead above this 5 microgram per deciliter threshold, although, as I mentioned, we really want to probably even lower that threshold. There's been talk of, of lowering it even more. But in this data set, it's about 4.2% of children. So this is just a histogram. Here's the, the threshold, and these are the, the children in the data set that are above. And so what we're trying to do is figure out how could we find these children before they're treated as like a canary in the coal mine and they show up at the doctor with too much lead in their blood. Um, it is good to know also that thanks to all these new regulations, on average, blood lead levels are declining over time. So this is from our data set. It's the average blood lead level for each of the years of data that we have. And, and you can see this decline. It's really, again, it's, this is the benefit of policies to eliminate lead from gasoline, paint, food cans, control lead in community water systems. But even with these efforts, you still have even, you know, in our most recent years, these are observations, these are our measured blood concentrations, so you still are having kids who are above this line. And these circles might represent multiple kids, actually, each one. So we want to find these, these people, again, before they show up with elevated lead. So our logistic regression did confirm my hypothesis. And again, I really started with this hypothesis. We see lead in the water in these private wells. Nobody has ever looked before to see if lead in private well water in the United States is associated at all with children's blood lead. So this is the first time anybody's done this. And what this is just showing is that the, um, these are the odds that a child will have blood lead above five, five micrograms per deciliter. And the reference is, these are the kids with the city water service. So compared to the kids with the city water service, the kids with the private well water have about 25% increased odds, about a 25% increased odds. And I'm not showing all the other controls in this regression, just to make this clear. But, but there is a signal. So this was kind of confirming, again, the hypothesis that I, uh, I came up with. Um, this is the rest of the regression model. Again, these regression models are very constraining because you have to assume all these variables that might be associated with what you're interested in, that your, your risk can be expressed as some kind of a linear function of these variables. So I have a lot of variables in my model, and I've shown some of the, the coefficients in this linear function for some of them. But the things in the model, again, here's the private well water, the age of the child in months here. Um, the year the house was built, and, and these, some of these things are in because they're things that experts think are important, right? So they're, they're not turning out to be significant for this particular risk. But the age of the house is significant. Houses built before 1950, compared to them, the newer houses, kids are at lower risk um, because there's not lead in the paint, most likely. Um, um, let's see, there's some demographic information about the neighborhood, the value of the home. So people, kids who live in homes that are worth more money tend to have lower blood lead levels or lower risk of elevated blood lead. Um, 
Let's see. Yeah, this is um, whether they live in one of these peri-urban areas. These tend to be lower income communities. And so those kids are a little bit more at risk. So anyway, the, this logistic regression, it's just like what Steve said. You know, you go through your traditional workflow, you throw some variables in the model, and you end up with this um, type of linear function. Um, the Bayesian network model also found that uh, relying on a private well, those kids are at higher risk. And so here is output from my nice Bayesian lab model. Here I'm entering evidence and saying, OK, for the kids on private wells in this data set, the risk of having a blood lead above the CDC threshold is 7.8% almost. For the kids with regulated community water supply, it's below 3%. So we see that effect. Um, and maybe this conclusion is stretching it too much, but you know we see that the Bayesian network pre is predicting a stronger effect. This is a odds of a, a quite lar much larger increase in the odds ratio compared to what the logistic regression shows. Um, what are the most important factors in the Bayesian network model? So here's a, a picture of my model. Um, it's the year the lead test was taken. That's the most important one. Here's what I'm trying to predict, blood lead. Um, and why is this important? It's because, again, all those regulations have taken effect to control lead from other sources other than private well water. So that's very important. But after that, water source um, is a very important predictor. So I think clearly where I probably need help here is figuring out a more parsimonious model, <laughs> even though this is a large data set. But there are a lot of interactions going on here. And there may be some other ways to approach this. Um, so let's see. Let's get on to model performance. Um, so ultimately, where I want to get is, uh, is something that the public health department in Wake County, or bro more broadly, the state of North Carolina, can use to say, OK, we're going to go knock on doors of some of these households. And or the health department actually has these flyers that they distribute to houses with private wells. But it's really laborious to go door to door to every household with a private well. So if they could prioritize, where would they go first? So this was just to show, whoops, let's see. Here, um, ah, this is a, a relatively lower risk household. It would be, if we just look at kids tested in the most recent five years or so on community water systems in low income areas. So this is the median household income in the child's neighborhood in newer houses built after 2005, we know race, uh, African-American children are at much higher risk of elevated blood lead than white children or children of any other races. So if we're looking, if we're zooming in on these neighborhoods that are low income, majority African-American, even newer houses, more recent years, if the, if the kids have community water, their risk of elevated blood lead is about 3.4%. If we then just change that one thing, and I'm sorry I, I messed this up, but the only thing I'm changing here is I'm changing um, the water source from community water to private well. You can see the risk has gone up to over 20%. So obviously, you know, you could map out these neighborhoods that look like this, where the, the kids are on private wells. They're even newer houses, high proportions of African-American populations, lower census blocks. So the health department start, might start by targeting those kinds of neighborhoods. So that's what I'm after. Uh, let's see. Yeah. OK. Right, so the difference, again, for the kids with community water, they're at much lower risk, even if all those other characteristics of the house and the neighborhood and the kids are remaining fixed. Um, this is my rock curve. Like I said, what I want is a, is a classifier that will get a curve up this way. And this is where I am right now so far with my Bayesian network model. And the area under the curve is a little over 0.8. It's only a little bit better than the logistic regression. So I think I, I need to work on this some more. And I, and I haven't run tests yet to determine whether this difference is statistically significant or not. Um, but anyway, the, I guess wrapping up, we have found Again, this is for the very first time that there's evidence that kids with private well water, at least in this one particular county, are at higher risk of elevated blood lead compared to kids with community water. And our network model has reasonably strong predictive accuracy, um, is indicating that there's probably some interactions that need to be considered when prioritizing houses for outreach.
And this is where I'm hoping to go in the future, again, is to build something that health departments can use, and then they can do targeted mailings and things to try to get to these houses um, and, and help them check their water quality and help them um, determine an appropriate intervention if the water has a lot of lead in it. Uh, next steps, I think there's still some potential lead exposure sources that if we can account for them in our modeling, we might get a stronger classifier. And one would be, right now, all the kids who have any kind of regulated public water supply are in one category, but recently with uh, some of my students, they've been able to categorize the water systems in terms of their size. And there's a lot of evidence that some, some of our water systems in the US are very small, um, maybe serve only 100 households or fewer, and they're regulated, but they tend to struggle. So we want to see if some of the kids getting their water from those smaller systems as com compared to ones with who are connected to like the big city water supplies are more at risk. Um, we also want to use information. So again, all water systems have to monitor their water, and we want to see if maybe violations of this rule are predictive at all. And then another idea is to code the proximity of their houses to additional lead sources. There's a lot of evidence that people who live near roadways that were used during the times of leaded gasoline, you know, those houses tend to be more at risk because there's a lot of lead in the soil. When lead gets in the environment, it stays for a very long time. And then ideally to, um, I'm not at this point yet, but to use the wonderful mapping interface of Bayesian Lab to develop a map that we could then share with the health department and tell them, okay, here's where you guys need to go look. So um, with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, many people who've made this possible, including the EPA, which has supported this research through their Science to Achieve Results program. Um, Ed Norman from the North Carolina Childhood Blood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program, who made the data available to us. And then many research collaborators, and this is just a, a partial list of them, but um, uh, three other faculty members working with me on this project, and then one of my former students, Ali Clonch, who did a lot of the d data coding and data merging for this. And with that, I will take questions and especially ideas for strengthening, you know, what kinds of additional algorithms might I try to get the very best possible classifier with my data set that I have.